On July 24, 1944, prisoners of war throughout Germany discovered new notices pinned up in their compounds. Written in the familiar authoritarian tone that the American, British, Canadian, and other Allied prisoners were familiar with, the threats within must have nonetheless seemed unnecessary to men completely at the mercy of their captors. For nearly five years, their welfare had been governed by Germany's recognition of international laws guaranteeing their protection, but the notices had a deeper, hidden message. Adolf Hitler was increasingly willing to simply disregard international laws altogether when they no longer suited him, including those laws demanding humane treatment of his prisoners. In 1939, Germany assured the International Committee of the Red Cross that they would abide by the conditions outlined by the 1929 Geneva Convention regarding prisoners of war, understanding that the resources required to feed, house, and care for prisoners would be nearly as intensive as those needed for typical rear area troops of their own military. Furthermore, they understood that the cost for these resources could not be recouped by employing them for war-related work. These conditions imposed considerable expense, but until 1941, the Germans and their enemies mostly abided by these agreements. The overwhelming German victories early in the war left half a million Poles and nearly two million Frenchmen in German hands, along with significant numbers of Norwegian, Belgian, Dutch, and British servicemen. Unwilling to care for all of them, Dutch and Flemish soldiers were quickly paroled, along with 90% of the Poles and about a third of the French. The remainder stayed in German captivity, with small numbers occasionally released or exchanged for skilled laborers. Hitler's decision to retain so many prisoners from the defeated nations met with the letter of international law, even if it violated its spirit. The armistice with France promised that French POWs would be repatriated after a formal peace treaty was signed, which aligned with the terms of Article 75 of the Geneva Convention. However, Hitler refused to conclude a formal peace treaty and used the prisoners as convenient blackmail for as long as he could. The raid on Dieppe in August 1942 demonstrated the utility of keeping these prisoners, the German 302nd Infantry Division reported French civilians had not interfered with German forces during the fighting, and some had even assisted by fighting fires, tending wounded, and providing refreshments for the Germans. These reports were likely exaggerated for propaganda effect. Jacques Mordal, a native Frenchman, published an account of the raid with an entire chapter regarding the often overlooked effects on the civil population. Anecdotal evidence suggested the French cooperation had been mostly out of fear or simple humanitarian instincts, rather than willingness to help the Germans. Regardless, just two days after the raid, Mayor Lavasseur was summoned to a meeting with Oberst Bartelt, commanding the German 571st Infantry Regiment, along with the chief of the local German military government in Dieppe. The matter at hand was an offer by the Germans to pay one million francs as compensation for damage to the city during the battle, as well as the 48 French civilian killed and 100 wounded. Monsieur Lavasseur reminded the Germans that while the money was appreciated, a thousand local men still remained in German prison camps two years after the fall of France and requested their release. Delighted by their victory, the Germans acquiesced happily, and with Hitler's personal approval, several hundred French soldiers returned to their homes and families. Financial compensation and prisoner releases were a reminder that France was still considered a nation-state, even though under German occupation. Things were different for others. Swiss inspectors often found Polish prisoners, for example, living in poor conditions compared to British prisoners. Even when released from status as prisoners of war, the Poles were often retained under German control as slave labor. The legal argument the Germans made with regard to occupied countries like Poland and Yugoslavia was that since their countries no longer existed as such, it was impossible for them to retain prisoner of war status and were therefore no longer a protected class. Professor Simon McKenzie referred to a mutual hostage factor, an understanding that mistreatment of enemy prisoners could cause harm to one's own soldiers in enemy hands by way of reprisals. This deterrence couldn't exist once an enemy nation was defeated and they released all their German prisoners. In January 1943, faced with German demands for a quarter million more French war workers, the Premier of Vichy France suggested converting French POWs already in German hands into contract laborers. It was a terrible deal for the prisoners who gained little by way of freedom and lost many of the protections of the Geneva Convention. Rather than having military guards provide shelter, food, and medical care, they found themselves at the mercy of the Gestapo instead. The Germans, however, were so enthusiastic about the idea that they even tried to get back the 300,000 Dutch prisoners they had paroled three years earlier. 
About 8,000 voluntarily submitted to being reinterred, though coercion eventually increased these numbers. After Italy switched sides in September 1943, over half a million Italian soldiers were disarmed and rounded up. And despite the fact that Germany remained at war with the legitimate Italian government in southern Italy, Italian captives were never granted legal POW status by the Germans. The Italian puppet government in northern Italy under Mussolini gave this situation a lame bit of legitimacy when it officially placed these IMIs, Italian military internees, at the disposal of the Germans. German legal authorities in the high command of the Wehrmacht, or armed forces, and the Abwehr intelligence service wrung their hands over many of these machinations, and even Fritz Saukel, Hitler's overseer of the slave labor force, admitted misgivings over the conversion of POWs into laborers. As was the case in many areas, Germany was willing to aggressively push the bounds of international law to suit its own purposes. The war on the Eastern Front, however, was characterized by a disregard for international law and humanitarian concerns right from the start. As is well known, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, the nature of warfare there was much different than against the Western Allied powers. Nazi ideology considered the Slavs as racially inferior, and the inhabitants of the USSR were referred to as Jewish Bolsheviks. They were portrayed as an existential threat which needed to be wiped away to ensure the superior race its proper Lebensraum, or living room. This ideological dimension was understood by senior army commanders to mean that the rules of international law would not apply. An order was issued in June 1941 that political commissars would be considered criminals, not soldiers, and executed on sight, one of many ways Hitler urged the army to abandon both moral restraint and the rule of law as far as their eastern adversaries were concerned. Not surprisingly, the thousands of Soviet prisoners collected in the great encirclement battles of the early months of the Russian campaign were treated exceedingly poorly, and in many cases no quarter was given, meaning prisoners simply weren't taken. For those that did survive long enough to be taken to the rear, thousands were herded into open-air pens without adequate food, water, or medicine. If any legal defense of any of this could be claimed, it was that the Soviet Union was not a signatory of the 1929 Geneva Convention, and therefore so it was believed by the Germans, their prisoners were not entitled to its protections. Article 82, however, stated that if one belligerent was not a signatory, their adversaries were still subject to its conditions. That there was an ideological factor in play in the East is not in doubt, as just one illustration, free French troops taken up in 1942 fighting for the Allies, whose service violated the terms of the Vichy French Agreement with Nazi Germany, were treated as humanely by the Germans as other French prisoners. Some Germans did object to the harsh treatment of their eastern adversaries. The Foreign Office's international law section actually suggested both sides observe the Hague Convention, and senior officials of the Wehrmacht Intelligence Service, including its head, Admiral Canaris, tried to argue that brutal treatment of POWs would ultimately be counterproductive. At a minimum, resentful prisoners would require more guards to ensure security. At worst, it would stiffen resistance in the field, since enemy troops would be more reluctant to give up, and finally, neglect of prisoners would give the Soviets an excuse not to treat German prisoners well in return. Hitler dismissed these arguments, rationalizing the Soviets would mistreat Germans with or without an excuse. Worse, he thought, German troops might get the, quote, wrong idea, unquote, about surrendering themselves to the Red Army. A good German, Hitler thought, always fought to the death. Ultimately, the realization that a vast force of potential laborers was being wasted caused the Germans to modify their treatment of prisoners by the end of 1941. They were finally ordered back to camps in Germany, and by that point only 1.1 million prisoners of the nearly 4 million Soviet prisoners taken were still alive, and these were so weakened by sickness and malnutrition that only between a third and half of them were fit for labor. Conditions only marginally improved over time, never reaching the level of care afforded their British and American counterparts, and by the spring of 1945, 3.3 million Soviet prisoners of war had died in German hands, nearly six out of every ten service personnel captured. For their part, the Soviets had pledged early on to follow the 1907 Hague Convention and continued to pay lip service to this pledge as a propaganda measure for foreign consumption, while domestic propaganda portrayed the Germans as animals or mad dogs for whom death was the only appropriate treatment. Prisoners taken early in what they called the Great Patriotic War were treated so poorly they suffered as high as a 90% death rate. Like Admiral Canaris, however, some Russian commanders noted that this treatment simply persuaded German troops to fight harder, knowing surrender would likely not prevent their death. 
and like the Germans, the Soviets belatedly realized prisoners could help make up labor shortfalls at home. In all, over three million German prisoners were taken by the Soviet Union, about a third of which died in captivity. Both sides refused to let representatives of the International Committee of the Red Cross or the Vatican visit their prisoner of war camps. German conduct of the war against the Soviet Union was thus characterized from start to finish by a disregard for international law. As for the other far-reaching crimes of the regime the German soldier was fighting for, Matthew Cooper discussed in detail the compartmentalization of the Third Reich, the implementation of the Final Solution, the euphemistic code name for the destruction of the Jews, was dependent on the army to acquire new territories and control over civilian populations. Cooper notes, It can never be established with certainty just how much, during the war, the German generals knew of Hitler's dictatorship. At the time the final solution was implemented in 1941, security within the Reich was stricter, the prisons of the Gestapo were never fuller, and the power of the SS grew as each month passed, but few soldiers were aware of this. Hitler ruled by keeping his subordinates constantly competing with each other and insisted that information be doled out on a need-to-know basis. In Cooper's words, Military commanders hardly knew of events or plans beyond the flanks of their own commands, let alone of what was happening in the Reich. Of the crimes in their own areas of operation, however, there was more tangible understanding. While some generals objected to the treatment of Jews and others in the captured territories, most seemed to have either paid lip service to the party program or enthusiastically supported it. One army instruction three days after the start of the Russian campaign reminded the troops of the bitterness and inhuman brutality of the Soviet soldier and insisted that there was no need to issue preliminary warnings to prisoners in the act of flight. Rather than shout out an order to stop, it was permissible simply to shoot on sight. In other ways, the army also attempted to soften the ideological aspects of the campaign. Von Manstein, for example, ordered civilians be treated correctly, as did von Kleist in 1943, insisting that people be treated as allies rather than inferiors, not for humanitarian purposes, of course, but because not doing so would increase enemy will to resist and ultimately cost more German lives. Heavy security in the German rear areas, which in the Soviet Union were expansive, also placed additional burdens on manpower and supplies. The Commissar Order proved to be very unpopular, and no intelligent general could doubt that it was illegal, as they had been prohibited from distributing it in writing. Von Brauchitsch modified the order to be applied only if it could be proven a man in question had taken action against German soldiers. Some commands refused to implement it at all, and protests were frequent. Von Bock requested the order be officially revoked, and the Second Army noted in an official report its opinion that the order was responsible for stiffened resistance. OKH, the Army High Command, did officially request OKW, the Armed Forces High Command, to relax the order, something that Hitler refused to do, though by May 1942 even he reluctantly admitted that sparing the commissars would be beneficial in persuading encircled Russian forces to more readily surrender. For the most part, Western Allied troops captured by the Germans were treated humanely, not only due to an innate humanitarian ethos, as Professor Mackenzie called it, but there was also the knowledge that German soldiers would be in enemy hands, incentivizing decent treatment. Castle, ...followed by the Swedish liners Gripsholm and Drottningholm reached Liverpool. They brought several thousand repatriated prisoners. British Empire Despite the ravages of war, ten separate prisoner exchanges were made of seriously disabled men and accompanying medical personnel, involving 20,000 Axis troops and over 12,000 Allied POWs. Unlike with Soviet prisoners, camps housing prisoners from the other Allies received regular visits from the Red Cross, who inspected living and working conditions, facilitated communication with families back home, and delivered aid packages with food and necessities to augment the sometimes meager supplies provided by their German captors. The handcuffing incidents discussed in Part 2 of this series serve as a good example of how the Germans and the Allies interpreted international law differently, as it was not explicit in the Geneva Convention's terms whether or not binding the hands of prisoners was a violation. What was explicitly prohibited was the use of reprisals against prisoners, which in legal terms means the use of an illegal action to compel an enemy to cease their own illegal activities. When the Germans discovered evidence of a British policy of binding the hands of German prisoners taken during commando operations, Allied POWs in Germany were handcuffed as a reprisal. The British only received lukewarm support for their counter-reprisal as the Americans and Canadians preferred not to get involved, 
On the Axis side, the Italians and Japanese were equally unwilling to participate, given the large number of Italian prisoners in Allied hands and the Japanese civilians in Canadian and American internment camps. With some back-channel diplomacy, the matter eventually went away in 1943 without public notice. The willingness of the British to make conciliatory gestures during this period was seen as a sign of weakness by Hitler and others high up in the German chain of command. The Germans increasingly proved willing to take retaliatory measures against prisoners of war as revenge for what they considered unacceptable actions. The commando order issued in October 1942 exemplified Hitler's growing frustration with adhering to the rules of war. Any commandos taken prisoner, even in uniform, were to be handed over to the Sicherheitsdienst, the security service, who was charged with executing them. In fact, as early as October 1941, orders had been issued to shoot commandos under the false pretense that they were attempting to escape custody, and in July 1942, a similar order was promulgated, directing that paratroops captured in battle should also be handed to the Gestapo, rather than be processed as regular prisoners of war. Unlike the handcuffing episode, in which both the Germans and the Allies felt they were on reasonable legal grounds, the commando order and similar orders were done in secret, distributed only to top commanders with directions that they were not to be distributed to the rank and file, nor fall into enemy hands. On this basis alone, one may make the assumption that those issuing these orders realized they would not be considered legal or reasonable, and that public awareness of them would be a legitimate call for reprisals by enemy nations. And while the Allies did know about the commando order because of their code-breaking efforts, codenamed Ultra, they couldn't reveal that knowledge without tipping the Germans to the fact they were able to decode transmissions using the Enigma machine, a secret that was kept until the 1970s. The commando order proved to be even more unpopular among German commanders than the Commissar order. General Rommel destroyed his copy of the order as soon as it was received, and commanders in the West refused to implement it. Hitler blamed the Army High Command and complained they were more interested in developing clergymen than soldiers. Increasingly, Matthew Cooper notes, it became necessary for the SS authorities to take such matters out of the Army's control, since Hitler could not rely on them to carry out orders they thought to be illegal. The commando order exemplifies the ways in which the Germans, as directed by Hitler, had gone beyond simply interpreting international law in their own favor to ignoring it altogether. Two major events occurred in March of 1944 that fundamentally changed the relationship between prisoners of war held in Germany and their captors. The first is now known as the Bullet Order. On 4 March 1944, a secret order was issued stating that any escaped prisoners of war had to be turned over to the SD to be executed by shooting. The order explicitly accepted British and American prisoners since the mutual hostage factor was still considered important. The exception of escaped British and American prisoners remained in force for just three weeks. On the night of 24-25 March 1944, as was popularized by the well-known Hollywood film The Great Escape, several dozen prisoners of war tunneled out of Stalag Luft III, a prisoner camp for Air Force personnel run by the German Air Force. It was an audacious plan born of the determination of RAF squadron leader Roger Bushel to keep enemy resources held down away from the front line. The camp was located at Zagan in Lower Silesia, hundreds of kilometers from neutral borders or friendly forces. The plan called for 250 prisoners to escape the camp through a tunnel in a single night. Planning had been complex. Uniforms were retailored to resemble civilian clothes or even German uniforms. Counterfeit identification documents and train tickets were distributed, and three separate tunnels had been started before a consolidation of effort had extended one of them all the way past the barbed wire and open ground surrounding the camp. Once the escape began on the night of 24 March 1944, critical snags developed. The tunnel had been incorrectly terminated short of the trees which would hide the prisoner's final egress. There was a minor cave-in during the escape that had to be repaired, and then another. Precious time was lost. Then a German sentry found the exit. A handful of hopefuls were collected from the tunnel, but by the time a complete roll call could be taken, it was discovered 76 prisoners had gotten away. The immediate action of the camp staff was to place 42 phone calls, according to an established protocol which demanded immediate notice of an escape. The Luftwaffe Prisoner of War Command was on the list, as were nearby rail stations and even aerodromes, since ambitious escapees in the past had tried to commandeer aircraft. One of the phone calls to the head of the Kripo, the criminal police, resulted in a Kriegsvondung, a war emergency manhunt. Given the scope of the escape, 
It was immediately upgraded to a Großwandung, a national emergency mobilization which activated men from police, armed forces, SS, Hitler Youth, and even German air raid service units across German-controlled Europe. The English translation for the term given at the trial of Hermann Goering was General Hue and Cry. In this sense, mass breakouts may have done more harm than good. While the manhunt would indeed consume precious German manpower resources, a previous Grossvondung mounted after a 43-man escape elsewhere had resulted in 14,000 arrests and the recovery of 809 escapees from earlier events who were living relatively safely in the occupied territories, as well as over 8,000 foreign workers who had deserted and nearly 5,000 domestic criminals on the lam from the German police. While plans for the German manhunt got underway, events were quickly growing beyond the ability of the Luftwaffe Prisoner of War Command to control them. The mass escape had caused an outburst of anger in Berlin, and Hitler, who had long since tired of playing by the rules, ordered all recaptured escapees summarily shot. Hermann Goering, head of the Air Force, got into a shouting match with Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, responsible for state security, and Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, head of the Armed Forces High Command. Himmler estimated at least 60,000 soldiers would be required to round up the prisoners. Hitler said it wouldn't matter since they would be shot anyway. Goering pointed out a massacre couldn't be covered up and reprisals against German pilots in Allied custody would surely follow. Hitler compromised. If he couldn't shoot them all, then at least half of them should be killed. Himmler pulled a round figure of 50 out of the air. As with the commando order, the matter was designated top secret, and Himmler assigned the work of killing the prisoners to his own security department. Field Marshal Keitel, the chief of OKW, discussed the matter with General Mayor Adolf Vesthoff of the General Staff, soon to be the officer in charge of prisoner of war affairs, replacing General Mayor von Krefenitz, who was also at the meeting. The bodies would be cremated and returned to Stalagluf III as a deterrent to future escapes. The pair of generals pointed out the obvious to Keitel, that the shootings and the cremations were violations of the Geneva Convention. Vestoff recorded a summary of the conversation despite orders that nothing be written down and submitted it to Keitel to verify the instructions. Keitel signed off on the minutes, but crossed out the word shot and added marginally that he did not exactly say shot, but rather recaptured escapees were to be handed over to the Gestapo. It was a fine distinction, but Keitel must surely have realized in the end it meant the same thing for the prisoners. In the meantime, the machinery had already been set in motion by Himmler, who called Ernst Kaltenbrunner, his second-in-command and chief of the Reich Security Office, and ordered him to prepare the text of a secret message to be sent out to any Gestapo field office to which recaptured escapees were brought to. The recaptured men were to be driven in small numbers back towards Zagan and shot at some point along the route, with a report to be sent in saying they had tried to escape. Kaltenbrunner advised his immediate subordinates, Heinrich Müller, the chief of the secret state police, or Gestapo, and Arthur Neba, chief of the criminal police, or Kripo. Neba was to select the 50 officers, and he did so using duplicate personnel records of the prisoners kept on file in Berlin. These records, generally on an index card, were usually only kept for captured colonels and generals, but all air crew, regardless of rank, were considered important enough to also keep track of. A day after the breakout, nearly half the escapees had already been caught and were waiting in Kripo jails, expecting to be returned to Stalagluf III. Wilhelm Scharpwinkel, head of the Breslau Gestapo, informed his Kripo counterpart in Breslau, Max Wielen, that the Gestapo was taking responsibility for the execution of the prisoners. It is worth pointing out that Article 8 of the 1907 Hague Convention notes that escape prisoners who are retaken before being able to rejoin their own army, or before leaving the territory occupied by the army which captured them, are liable to disciplinary punishment. The term disciplinary suggests modifying future behavior or correcting disobedience. One's behavior cannot be modified if they are dead. On 6 April 1944, the senior British officer of Stalag Luft III, Group Captain Massey, was called to the German Commandant's office. Massey was aware that six escapees had been returned to the camp and placed in solitary confinement. The fate of the other 70 men was still unknown when the Commandant informed Massey that 41 officers had been shot in the act of escape. How many of them were wounded? Unable to contain his shock, Massey asked, as depicted in the Great Escape film, how many of the 41 had been wounded. The answer was none. However, eight more officers returned to Stalag with three that afternoon. None. Massey was repatriated to England on medical grounds five days later, something that had already been in the works due to a severely lame foot that had suffered injuries in both world wars. 
His successor as senior British officer met with officials of the Swiss protecting power on 17 April, and on 12 May, the names of all 50 deceased escapees were provided by the Swiss to the British Foreign Office in England. Over the next two months, 46 urns and four boxes containing the ashes of the 50 arrived at Stalogluft III. Cremation of military casualties was unusual, so unusual that the immediate suspicion was that the precise means of death was being concealed. Escaping men might be shot multiple times in different parts of their bodies. The Gestapo's method of execution was a single pistol shot at the base of the neck. When Massey arrived back in the UK, he was able to provide much circumstantial evidence that a crime had been committed. The deaths had been reported directly to him by the Germans, and there had been much activity at the camp at the Gestapo afterwards, and while 17 surviving escapers were returned and placed in solitary confinement, they managed to smuggle out scraps of information about what had happened after they were recaptured, when they had been in brief contacts at that time with those who had been shot. Two other survivors had gone to Kolditz and for the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Just three had made it to safety in neutral countries. Additional evidence arrived courtesy a representative of the Swiss protecting power, who had visited Zagan even before the last of the murders had been committed. He officially expressed doubts that so many prisoners could have been shot in the act of escape, and provided London with a report detailing inquiries made by the new British senior officer at Stalagluf III and their collection of evidence from the surviving escapers. On 22 June 1944, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Anthony Eden, rose on the floor of the House of Commons to inform Parliament of the matter. He noted for the record his understanding that never before had His Majesty's government, or the protecting power, received word that a deceased prisoner of war in enemy hands had been cremated. It is abundantly clear, he told the House, that none of these officers met his death in the course of making his escape from Stalagluf III or while resisting capture. The Gestapo's contention that the wearing of civilian clothes by an escaping prisoner of war deprives him of the protection of the Prisoners of War Convention is entirely without foundation in international law and practice. From these facts there is, in His Majesty's government's view, only one possible conclusion. He issued a warning that the government was firmly resolved that these foul criminals shall be tracked down to the last man wherever they may take refuge. When the war is over, they will be brought to exemplary justice. Eden also informed the House of Commons that the German government, via the Swiss, had committed to providing details of the shootings. A month later, supposedly to ensure that the message intended by the 50 sets of earthly remains was properly interpreted by the prisoners, a notice was posted up at Stalagluf III, warning that the escape from prison camps is no longer a sport. The message was also spread to the other German prison camps. A more official response to British diplomatic inquiries was not forthcoming. On 22 July, the German Foreign Office presented Hitler with an official document for authorization, which Hitler tore up. He wrote his own draft, tore it up also, then told his own foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, to refuse to make any further statement since, Hitler declared, Mr. Eden had shown such insolence in the matter while speaking on the House of Commons floor and casting doubt about the official explanation that the men were shot while trying to escape. The British began to collect what intelligence they could from Massey and other survivors of the escape. There were limits to what they could find out, and at first blush it seemed that if 50 murders had occurred, it was out of character for the Commandant of Stalagluf III who, according to a German POW that knew of him, seemed to be pro-English and ensured his staff always treated the Allied prisoners correctly. German officials in neutral countries were also shaken by what had happened, and, Allied spies found, eager to distance the Army and Air Force from the SS, who operated at Hitler's personal command without regard for the law. British intelligence concluded that it wasn't likely the Luftwaffe had been responsible unless they had willingly handed control of the prisoners to the Gestapo, something they deemed unlikely given what they knew of Goering's relationship to Heinrich Himmler. The British set up a wanted list of likely suspects and the matter was added to the growing list of war crimes to be investigated after the war. Far from ordering reprisals, the most significant response was Anthony Eden's declaration in the House of Commons the perpetrators would be put on trial after the war and brought to exemplary justice. In May 1944, it may have been a mild threat, but not even a year later, the writing was clearly on the wall, and even Ernst Kaltenbrunner, 
who had organized the murders of the 50 airmen, refused to carry out Hitler's order in March 1945 to shoot any and all Allied aircrew who came down in German territory. The mutual hostage factor had been replaced by then by a desire to avoid personal indictment as a war criminal and continued to ensure that the Geneva Convention guided conduct in the West. In January 1945, Stalag Luft III was liberated by the Red Army. A request to the Russian foreign minister to begin investigations on the spot went nowhere, and with Zagan deep in Russian-held territory, there was nothing else that could be done immediately. In August 1945, recognizing the Stalag Luft III murders as the worst war crime committed against the Royal Air Force during the war, a unique special investigations unit was created made up exclusively of RAF men. The investigation is ably reported by Alan Andrews in his book Exemplary Justice. It was 17 months after the murders, and the big fish at the top of the German chain of command were either dead, missing, or awaiting trial already. At the highest level, Hitler and Himmler had committed suicide, and Goering and Keitel were to be tried at Nuremberg. The senior RSHA officials included Kaltenbrunner, who would be in the same dock as Goering and Keitel. Arthur Nabel was dead, executed by the Nazis before the end of the war as a conspirator in the July 1944 bomb plot. Gestapo Muller was officially missing, most probably killed in May 1945 attempting to flee Berlin after Hitler's suicide. Sharpwinkel of the Breslau Gestapo had been captured by the Soviets and was untouchable. In August 1945, none of the survivors at the top of the chain of command had long to live. Keitel and Kaltenbrunner were found guilty of war crimes and hanged in 1946. Guerin committed suicide after being sentenced to death, and Sharpwinkel died in a Russian prison in October 1947. Interrogation of one very junior Gestapo man, Peter Moore of the RSHA staff in Berlin, resulted in another lead. With a head for details, Moore recalled that the Gestapo office in Munich had deducted the cost of coffins and cremation from the money found on the executed prisoners. In a typically German touch, they returned any leftover money to the dead men's personal possessions and then returned the belongings to the Breslau Gestapo office, along with a receipt for the cost of the cremation. Moore mentioned it not to highlight the meanness of making the victims pay for their own cremation, but to highlight that only a private crematorium would have required payment in the first place. The victims had not been taken to nearby Dachau, for instance, where cremation of deceased inmates in the camp's purpose-built ovens was not an unusual occurrence and would not have cost the Gestapo men any money. The Gestapo men likely thought the secret nature of their mission would have been better served by using a public facility. At Dachau, they would have been in no position to give orders, but they could have used the full weight of their office when dealing with civilians. British investigators found the principal cremation register of the only public crematorium nearby, finding two entries had their names redacted. The Gestapo had apparently covered their tracks, but closer investigation revealed they had neglected to alter the cross-register of urns issued. The names of two of the shooting victims were recorded beside urn numbers matching the master register. As the investigation continued, a clearer picture of what happened began to form. Gestapo men proved to be forthcoming, usually citing superior orders in their defense. There was no large-scale massacre. Gestapo men bundled the prisoners into motor vehicles in ones and twos on the pretense of transferring them back to prison camp. As they traveled to the countryside in the direction of Zagan, a stop was made, and the recaptured prisoners were told to relieve themselves by the side of the road. When they exited the vehicle... They were executed with pistol shots to the head at close range. On 1 July 1947, Breslau Kripo Chief Wieland went on trial with 17 other Gestapo field agents, the men who had actually carried out the shootings. The defendants made two distinct claims. Firstly, that they were not aware their actions were illegal, in other words, a mistake of law. And secondly, a mistake of fact in that they did not realize the men were considered prisoners of war, and do the protections of the Geneva Convention, but rather that, since they had been captured in makeshift civilian clothes, they were to be considered spies and saboteurs. The prosecutor, in fact, agreed with the defense on the latter point, and stated in open court in his closing address that if the accused genuinely believed the men in their charge were saboteurs and legitimately subject to the death penalty, they should be acquitted. It was above all a statement of his own confidence that the evidence in trial proved beyond doubt that the men had known the victims were in fact prisoners of war. The defense failed to realize, however, that international law provided that even spies were entitled to a fair trial. Put another way, whether the men were prisoners or spies, they were never subject to summary execution. Not surprisingly, all 18 men had pled not guilty to the charges against them. Only Velen was convicted of conspiracy and escaped with life imprisonment. 
which was commuted to a lesser sentence. The other 17 men were found not guilty of conspiracy, but guilty of committing the murders. 13 were hanged, 2 received life sentences, and 2 men received 10 years imprisonment each. A second trial was conducted late in 1948, but by that point the British cabinet had decided to end the trials of German war criminals. The Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, had been unable to intervene in the murders of the 50 escapees from Zagan, as the matter had been quickly handed to the SS. Just two months later, with Allied planes bombing German cities with near impunity, and long-range fighters not only escorting the bombers, but also making free-ranging strafing attacks in which German civilians had been killed, Hitler proposed that the Wehrmacht stop its practice of restraining civilian mobs from taking out their frustrations on enemy airmen who bailed out over Reich territory. <laughs> Goebbels, the propaganda minister, had already been beating the drum for total war and encouraging civilians to take matters into their own hands. Allied air crew were branded terror fliegern, terror flyers. Professor McKenzie points out that, unlike earlier efforts at circumventing the terms of the Geneva Convention, this was quite open and not done in secret. The Wehrmacht had tried to keep a cooler head for years by that point. Every time orders from Hitler seemed sure to prompt reprisals and endanger Germans in Allied custody, the staff officers would engage in delaying tactics. By the spring of 1944, the military had been so successful at these kind of tactics that only the SS could be relied on to carry out illegal actions without question, as was the case after the Stahl III breakout. German civilians proved that they didn't need provocation to occasionally take vigilante action against downed Allied air crew. On 24 August 1944, nine U.S. airmen bailed out of a damaged B-24 near Graven, 148 kilometers southwest of Hanover, and offered no resistance and rounded up by civilians. They had decided not to carry pistols in their airplane at the suggestion of other crews who warned it would just cause them trouble. During and after their capture, angry civilians vented their anger at the so-called terror flyers with physical abuse. Passing into the hands of the military ironically provided them a measure of safety, as the soldiers recognized their responsibilities under international law, which guaranteed the safety of bailed-out air crew. The next day, eight of the prisoners were put on a train to an interrogation center, the trip was delayed by RAF bombing, and the crew sat it out in an air raid shelter. At other rest stops on the way, the men were jeered at and spit on by angry civilians. The train stopped about 240 kilometers away from Graven at Rüsselsheim, which had just been bombed the previous night. Three waves of RAF Lancasters had rained down bombs and incendiaries, causing fires that could be seen by the departing British crews a hundred miles away. 198 people were killed on the ground, 177 of whom were foreign laborers who had not been provided adequate air raid shelters. While the Opel factory at Rüsselsheim suffered damage, the old city had also been heavily hit, with many civilian dwellings destroyed. It was lousy timing. The Americans were escorted to Rüsselsheim by a pair of Luftwaffe guards to find a train on an alternate track. A small angry crowd spotted their 8th Air Force patches, and started throwing chunks of rubble from the bomb buildings. They eventually trapped the crew against a tall wall. One airman tried to explain in German that the rubble had not been their doing, but the mob had grown to a hundred rioters and quickly beat the men into a bloody heap. An SA man administered coup de gras shots to four of the men with a pistol before running out of ammunition. As the bodies were moved by a cart to the local cemetery, another air raid alarm went off, and two of the Americans, still alive, slid out from the corpses of their comrades to sneak away. Those deemed responsible for the massacre were put on trial in June 1945. Whether or not the crowd had been encouraged by the regime's official calls for reprisals wasn't clear to the prosecutor, although many of the town citizens had taken Goebbels' words to mean that they couldn't be prosecuted. Their country had instructed them how to fight the war, and they had simply obeyed. It was to become an often heard defense over the next few years. At Rüsselsheim, 11 citizens and one soldier were tried. Only one was acquitted. The soldier was found guilty and executed along with five of the civilians. Two females had death sentences commuted to 30-year prison terms. The other four received prison sentences. As was the case with the Stahlaglyph three murders, those at the top of the chain of command who had called for lawlessness did not survive the war. Propaganda Minister Goebbels killed himself shortly after Hitler's death. A topic briefly touched on at the end of Part 3 was the subject of consciousness of guilt. 
the modern legal term refers most commonly to a type of circumstantial evidence exhibited by accused offenders in the period after an offense has been committed. Observers may wonder, for example, at the brazenness of German soldiers who pose proudly for photographs alongside executed civilians. To modern Western sensibilities, this is indicative of some sort of moral defect. A survey of unguarded conversations between German prisoners of war, however, suggests it is simply indicative of a very different world view than we may be comfortable with today. In stark terms, the men grinning beside executed civilians didn't consider these acts criminal or even out of the ordinary, but rather accepted such deeds as one of the many unpleasant burdens they bore as soldiers. There was also a widespread belief that those who issued the orders would bear the responsibility for any acts later deemed illegal. After the First World War, the defense had been used successfully in war crimes trials, leading to acquittals of Germans accused of war crimes. The first German general to be tried for war crimes by the U.S. following the Second World War was Anton Dostler, who admitted ordering the execution of 15 American soldiers in Italy. Dostler's defense cited superior orders, including the infamous Commando Order, and his legal obligation to obey them. His arguments were rejected, and he was executed on 1 December 1945, his case setting a precedent for the sequence of international trials that followed it. Based on past experiences, the appeal to superior orders to evade responsibility was specifically excluded by the rules of the International Military Tribunal that conducted the Nuremberg trials. The defendants nonetheless invoked superior orders so often during the trials that it became known as the Nuremberg defense. Prosecutors of Adolf Eichmann in 1962 did not argue that his flight to South America, an assumption of a false identity, constituted consciousness of guilt, but the term was applied to the murder of the Jews in what may be the most blindingly obvious manifestation of consciousness of guilt in modern history, this blatantly criminal enterprise was cloaked in secrecy insofar as it was possible to hide the activities of the death camps in occupied Poland and mass shootings throughout Eastern Europe. Official documents were shrouded in euphemisms, such as the final solution of the Jewish question and Hitler's public proclamations of a vague prophecy of the fate of the Jews. The inability to be forthright about what may or may not have been an open secret in Nazi Germany betrays an obvious consciousness of guilt on the part of the perpetrators. In other words, an understanding that what they were doing was criminal by international standards, if not their own. The architects of the final solution stated explicitly that the extermination of the Jews was to be kept secret. While this secrecy may have been maintained in order to prevent public outcry, as had occurred over the T4 euthanasia program, for example, the conclusion drawn by Eichmann's prosecutors was that it betrayed a consciousness of guilt, in particular, the efforts undertaken to hide these crimes through disinterring and reducing to ashes by cremation the bodies of the victims and the destruction of the Gestapo archives in the last days of the regime. These actions, they argued, proved an understanding by the perpetrators of these atrocities that they were doing wrong. For what it is worth, while it seems unlikely now, the attempt to exterminate the Jewish peoples of Europe was not actually illegal under international law. The term genocide is thought to have been coined in 1943 or 1944 by a Jewish lawyer who escaped from Poland to Sweden after the outbreak of war. Raphael Lemkin had been researching the systematic destruction of Armenians by the Ottoman Empire during the First World War and was disturbed to find that such massacres were also not specifically prohibited by international law. This was rectified after 1945. Prisoners of war taken from the Western nations who happened to be Jewish were, generally speaking, unharmed, ironically due to the secretive nature of the final solution itself. By following the Geneva Convention and permitting third parties like the Red Cross to operate, it would have been impossible to hide the disappearance of thousands of Jewish prisoners and their lives had been saved by the military's reluctance to abandon dedication to the international protections that Germany had promised to uphold. Sometimes the Germans in the Second World War interpreted international laws where they existed differently than their adversaries in order to gain an advantage over citizens in hostile occupied territories or captive prisoners in Germany. Too often, however, and increasingly as the war went on, orders from Hitler demanded that international law be rejected completely. Some individuals were brave enough to speak out against the more criminal aspects of Hitler's policies, but most obeyed, some more enthusiastically than others. Overall, the army's less than total support for Hitler and his plans did not go unnoticed or unpunished. Had Germany won, 
plans were in the works to replace the armed forces with the far more obedient SS with its galaxy of security and secret police units. Himmler's command of the replacement army and the chain of command of the Volksgrenadier divisions suggest that movement had already started in the last months of the war. Hitler's bitter comment that the army seemed more interested in training clergymen than soldiers sums up nicely his frustration at the army's refusal to completely abandon ethical considerations in its conduct of the war and illustrates his own contempt for humanitarian principles. Matthew Cooper summed it up in 1976. Although the army's generals were men of great professional experience and, on the whole, of high standards of personal morality, they prostituted their talent to Hitler's megalomaniac will and allowed the militarily unskilled dictator to disregard their ethics and to neglect their well-founded strategic principles. For this, they received nothing but his contempt. Their knowing acceptance of the substitution of his dangerous amateurism for their sound expertise deserves also the contempt of history. There lay the greatest folly in the history of the German army. The sound expertise that Cooper refers to includes the respect many of his generals had for international law and the protections guaranteed to prisoners of war.